So uh, I'm Roald Hoffman. I'm a professor at Cornell University. Uh, I have a special connection to the NanoThread project. In part, it is through John Badding, and we'll explore that. And part, it is through, through the material. Uh, I have been at Cornell University for a long, long time, to be exact, uh, 55 years. Um, it's the only job I've had, essentially. I am now retired. I have been retired for a few years. I continued my work with postdocs, uh, and that is with when the nano thread work, uh, some of it was done at least. And I am fed problems from former students, from collaborators, and I'm still very much part of the NSF sponsored uh, nano thread effort in thinking and talking to people who are involved. I'm a theoretical chemist. Uh, that being said, uh, that covers a lot of different things. I'm, I'm interested in, in molecules of every kind and in applying the kind of qualitative thinking which has been a hallmark of my theory I have gone through most of chemistry, except for biochemical. Uh, I tend to call the kind of uh, theory that I do applied theoretical chemistry, not because it is directly useful. We give people ways of thinking. We give people frameworks for understanding. And uh, that is connection with understanding puts me in contact with teaching. So the teaching has been important to me throughout my career. When I was teaching at Cornell, as I said, I'm retired. Half the time I taught introductory chemistry at one level or another. And somehow the uh, rhetoric of pedagogy, the way of thinking about things in a teaching way, uh, penetrated my, my research in a certain way. I have activities outside of chemistry, but basically I'm a theoretical chemist. Even if I were to describe myself in, in a couple of words or a few words, I would say I'm a searcher after understanding. If you asked me to characterize myself in one word, I would say I'm, I'm a teacher rather than a researcher. But that is part of the story. That is, I think that all of these things, teaching, understanding, and research are all connected to each other. One of the best ways to, to, to understand something is to try to teach it. <laughs> understanding and explanation are actions that to me are intimately involved with teaching and honed by it. It could be that you could give the wrong explanation or an inadequate one, and it could be that you could teach somebody, but the very action of organizing something and actually saying it or writing it down, we learn by teaching. Uh, and so that's why I was jumping back and forth between characterizing myself as a searcher for understanding and a teacher, because to me, both are related. I'm an introvert, but I've learned how to be an extrovert in order to give freshman chemistry lectures and or to give other lectures. Well, I, I rise to the occasion. When I give a lecture, I come alive. So I'm an actor too. Uh, that's part of the story. It's also theater. Part of the story also may be shaped by my history, which you may or may not know about. Um, and that is that I grew up, uh, I was born in a happy Jewish family at the wrong time. And the wrong time was 1937. 
and the wrong place, which was Eastern Poland. Uh, and the reason that was that way is because the World War II was coming and we were caught up into it. The place where I was born was when my mother was born, 1911, was Austria-Hungary. When I was born, it was Poland. During the war, the Nazis ran over it. And after the war, it became part of the Soviet Union. And now is part of a free and independent Ukraine. OK, five changes of government with two and a half ways waves of what would be called ethnic cleansing now. This was not a happy place to be born in, though everyone who lived in it had great expectations. It was a, it was a bad place. During, during the war, we, I was as a five to seven year old hiding uh, with my mother my father was killed by the Nazis, uh, hiding with three more people in the attic of a schoolhouse. And for 15 months, we were there. Now, if you have a uh, sibling who is five to seven, you can understand what it means to keep a child quiet for 15 months in a constrained space. Anyway, I had to keep quiet. I learned how to read. I was continuously admonished to be quiet, both in just walking and in talking. And I think it's this that was in part behind um, being an introvert. And there was lots of time to think. And that's all we could do, in a sense, aside from reading. Not a particularly good example for coming into chemistry uh, because I, in fact, uh, did not make a commitment to chemistry till three quarters of the way through my PhD in chemistry. And I'll tell you the story a little bit. Beginning in Europe, we eventually came to the United States and uh, we settled in New York City. I, I was 11 and a half when we came. Uh, the, uh, America was very good to me. I went to a science-oriented high school. There was a lot of pressure on uh, me to go into medicine. There was no one in a family who was a doctor, but it's a typical pressure of um, immigrant families coming from certain backgrounds. In fact, I spend a lot of time at Cornell in, when I teach freshman chemistry in assuring kids, it's okay to tell your parents that you don't wanna be a doctor, but all they mean is the best. Uh, medicine was a, a stable profession across situations which were not stable. Um, under my picture in high school, it says medical research is a professional aim. Um, in fact, I, so I started college at Columbia as a pre-med. That meant taking lots of chemistry courses. I did very well in them. Uh, I took a physics course and got an A, but I did not think I was good enough for physics at the time. The reason was I had these friends who got A pluses and I was stupid and I had no idea of what research is like in either chemistry or physics. And I thought if I didn't get an A plus, I wasn't good enough for, for physics, which was crazy because right now I'm working at the borderline and publishing as much in physics journals as I am in chemistry journals. At Columbia and college, the world opened up. The world opened up in the humanities and the arts through a core curriculum that Columbia had, meaning a set of courses everyone took, which were survey courses in literature, in music and art. The science courses were pretty routine that I had. 
But my interest in science was maintained by summer research jobs, the kind of things which today are called undergraduate research experience. In my case, they were at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington and at Brookhaven National Laboratory. These programs exist to this day. They were an introduction to research. They kept me going. But I really was interested in the humanities and the arts. And one way of summarizing my career at Columbia was that um, by the end of it, I had worked up enough courage to tell my parents I didn't want to be a doctor, but I didn't have enough courage to tell them that I wanted to be an art historian. In fact, I went on to graduate school in chemistry. It was easy to do uh, at Harvard, and, uh, but I still didn't know that I really wanted to do chemistry. I, and I took a program in chemical physics. I took a year off in graduate school don't do this, to go to the Soviet Union. This is 1960. People don't take a junior year abroad in the Soviet Union. Uh, but there was an exchange program and I was newly married. And my wife and I went to the Soviet Union for a year. When I came back, I made him a commitment to chemistry. And it was the right field uh, for me in the end but I drifted into chemistry fairly slowly by this path that I just explained to you, uh, the pathway through chemistry. I could not have imagined that I would be heading back toward physics and that I would be thinking about superconductivity, let us say, or that I'd be thinking about the behavior of matter under high pressure could not have imagined that at the beginning of my career. There is a point in the research when the project is not done. The references are not in place. <laughs> the uh, drawings are imperfect. <laughs> I know there's a lot of work, but somehow there is a feeling that it has fallen into place and that you can see the end. Okay, that point is the most satisfying point. And it's enough for most of us to go through the hard work of getting it into, into shape. And then to have the paper come back and to see that other people are not happy with what you thought. <laughs> and and to realize that scientists, the referees, are not all born with logic. That is a real shock on the first papers that you write. But you get used to it somehow. It always hurts. We always know it can be done better. Now comes a little bit of a psychological difference, which you may have noticed among your friends and fellows, and that is that people differ a lot in when they're willing to let go of something. Uh, when they think this is good enough, it's never going to be perfect, but it's good enough. Anyway, that what's really satisfying to answer your question is realizing that you are at the point where you can see the end coming. It all goes back to college. And remember, I told you about this core curriculum at Columbia. One of the courses was a course in poetry taught by a great uh, teacher and poet at the time, Mark Van Doren. I, I fell in love with the idea of a poem. I still remember the poem that was sort of the crossover point for me. It was by Wallace Stevens and it's called Sunday Morning. And, um, I then, I didn't try to write poetry till midlife, and then eventually I tried to write this. I think I was, um, my being able to write science, well, was some driving force for trying to write poetry. Anyway, poetry was something I can try. I tried it. 
I should have taken a course at age 40. I could have, I was ashamed, I think, to take it at Cornell, uh, but I could have taken it at a community college. Why take a course? Because a course gives you a basic craftsmanship and provides criticism. When the teacher and your fellow students criticize a poem you read, you're, you are reading, you don't break out crying. Uh, it's part of the structure of a course. And uh, so I should have done that. Instead, I wrote poems, I submitted them and got rejection slips. Uh, I have persisted. I have published now it's seven collections, two are translations into Russian and Spanish. I have trouble getting published. I keep a logbook of submissions. You guys have had the experience of having some paper rejected by some journal, right? Until you try poetry, you don't know what rejection means. Um, I keep a logbook and uh, the average poem that gets accepted and many don't, has been submitted to, on average, uh, to about 10 different magazines before it's accepted. Anyway, I'm not that good a poet as I am a chemist. Those are the realities. And, but I try. I do write. I write sporadically. I write about everything, and science has a way of coming in about nature and love and the usual things. And uh, if, if you see a poetry reading, go to it. It's good for you. Nothing can happen to you except you fall asleep. The Science Cafes, the Cornelia Street, Street Cafe was a, a restaurant cafe in Greenwich Village in New York. And uh, one time uh, I got to give it talk there or to organize a talk there. It came about when I was on a sabbatical. I was at Columbia University and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Casey Cole, who's a writer about science, had a new book uh, about the ether in physics and she wanted to popularize it. And she, she asked the owner of that cafe who sponsors musical and literary events uh, in a small space in the cafe organized for her reading and he said you're not famous enough so she came to me and said uh, because i knew her and i knew her work that we'd give the reading together and the owner said you, neither of you is famous enough so then i i i asked a friend who is a great writer who's no longer alive this is Oliver Sacks, um, and a neurologist and writer. And I asked him, he lived near this cafe. I asked him, would he join us that evening? And all of a sudden we were famous enough with Oliver in it. So that was the beginning. We had Oliver, me, and Casey Cole. We didn't have any music component at that point. I actually was the art part and read a poem and Oliver talked about his childhood obsession with the element tungsten and an uncle that he had who was making tungsten filaments for light bulbs. And Casey Cole uh, read from her book. Hundreds of people showed up driven by Oliver and the owner of the cafe couldn't fit them in. There was only space for about 75. And he was overjoyed, of course. And so I jumped on the opportunity and said, can I organize this on a regular basis? So it came by by accident and it became something we had every month for a total of about 15 years. Uh, this entertaining science series. The components varied. I usually two were enough. One was a scientist talking, often without slides, which was a problem for scientists. It gave me a chance to meet incredible number of creative people. I have written 
essentially nothing about it. Maybe I will one of these days, but it was the greatest fun. You can see when you heard my story of uh, being interested in the arts at Columbia back in college, that again, I was playing out part of my life here. That is this interest in art and in, in science. It was great fun. There is a shovel uh, or, and you wonder what the heck is that shovel doing there? That shovel is actually coated with a thin layer of titanium that gives uh, blue and yellow and then diffraction colors, uh, which are not real colors. They're from the diffraction uh, that's on there, the kind of rainbows that you see when you see an oil slick. I told you I went to the Soviet Union in 1960 on an exchange. Since that time, I maintained ties uh, with Russian scientists during Soviet times. So I went to the Soviet Union quite often and talked about my work. And there was a special resonance there uh, between my work and that done by uh, Russian scientists. Anyway, 1990, the Soviet Union falls apart. As it fell apart, the scientists at various institutes, in particular my friends at the Institute of Organoelement Chemistry in, in Moscow, uh, prime place for organometallic chemistry, uh, they needed to make some money to, to support their research. So they started making souvenirs and peddling them. And we have these shovel heads. They electrochemically plated them with the titanium and then sold them. And the selling point was, this is what we need to shovel all the stuff that the world is giving us. Um, and that's the shovel behind me. Right next to it, you cannot see it in detail, but to the right, as you are looking, there is a print of St. George slaying the dragon, a painting by Paolo Cello that hangs in Florence in Italy. And that's a connection to the art history that got me uh, going in college. Right next to the right of it, maybe you can see is a portrait of the, but you cannot see who is in that portrait. It's a photograph. It happens to be Kenichi Fukui, who was the guy who and who became a friend, who was a friend, who received the Nobel Prize in the same year that I did in 1981. And we can go through all of them. There is a Mexican mask of a devilish figure to the left of my ear. Uh, and there, are, there is a landscape right behind my head, which is uh, an abandoned railroad track done by Neil Berger, an oil painting done by a friend. It goes on like that. Every one of those is part of my life. This video was produced by the Center for Nanothread Chemistry in an effort to promote an inclusive and equitable research environment. Postdocs and graduate students received the opportunity to interview a senior scientist in the center to nurture new professional relationships during an informal chat with guided discussion questions during video production. Their discussion was recorded, edited, and posted to share their advice, experience in science, scientific challenges, and more.